Vajma to Dr. Byrne. All right. Okay, I'm gonna be presenting a case today that um, I saw while I was on the pediatric rotation. Um, all right, so this is a case of a six-year-old female who initially presented to clinic with the complaint, well, her parents' um, chief complaint was a, an abnormal head position. And this was July of 2015, but her parents and teachers had noticed kind of her starting to turn her head around October of 2014. So it had been going on for quite a while. And really the only other thing they had noted was some frequent tripping, um, which they weren't sure if that was just because of this head turn or really what was going on. But otherwise she was healthy, no other past medical history. Um, she had, because of this um, head turn and uh, she saw an outside optometrist who thought that she had some amblyopia and Duane syndrome and referred her to um, the pediatric ophthalmology clinic. So when she was seen, her visual acuity was 2060. Um, her business exam was significant for a large left head turn. Uh, she had impaired adduction in the right eye and impaired abduction in the left eye, so kind of a left conjugate gaze palsy. But the rest of her extracular motility was full. She was ortho and primary gaze, no um, large refractive error. And the remainder of her dilated exam and foot lamp exam was normal. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about a horizontal conjugate gaze palsy and what um, kind of go over some anatomy and differentials. So it can localize to a few different um, uh, locations. Uh, a lesion in the contralateral frontal eye field can cause it, an ipsilateral paramedian pontine reticular formation lesion, or an ipsilateral abducens nucleus lesion. Um, so if we were to view the abducens nerve nucleus, uh, uh, we can remember that the nucleus not only innervates the ipsilateral lateral rectus, but it also sends uh, neurons to the medial rectus of the contralateral eye. So if you get a lesion of the nucleus, you do get a conjugate gaze palsy. Um, and then just kind of similarly, uh, or a few things that are, I don't know how this, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> A few things that are related to this uh, anatomy, we can remember that the seventh cranial nerve and the, um, uh, facial, uh, uh, the facial nerve here go, is in close proximity. And so a lot of times, you know, we do see lesions that can cause a conjugate gaze palsy or uh, a cranial nerve six palsy in association with a cranial nerve seven palsy. Um, and then also, just as a reminder, that one and a half syndrome is another thing you can get with lesions in this um, area where you have damage to the abducens nucleus and the ipsilateral ML, um, um, uh, MLF, which can cause, essentially, you have a conjugate gaze palsy and an ipsilateral INO where you have only preserved uh, contralateral abduction. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, so if we think about a differential diagnosis for a conjugate gaze palsy, I wanted to break it down into adult and pediatric differentials, but realizing that this, you know, you can have all these in the pediatric population. So we can think about brainstem ischemia, infiltration, trauma, inflammation, compression, demyelination, or Nicky Korsakoff syndrome, which, as a reminder, is a metabolic insult, and it can insult the cranial nerve 6 nucleus. We can see it in a lot of different things, including pancreatitis, anything where you have kind of abnormal electrolytes, um, but also most commonly in uh, alcoholism, and then ALS. And there are a rare uh, complications of listeria, listeria meningoencephalitis, where you can get cranial nerve um, palsies, so infectious causes as well. In the pediatric population, we have more um, congenital problems that are on the differential that I'll kind of review some of these that are a little more rare. and. We probably haven't gone over too much before, but a brainstem AV malformation could certainly cause a conjugate gaze palsy. A neoplasm such as a pontine glioma is on the differential, and we'll go through the rest of these. And 
you know, in this patient, this is a new onset kind of acute presentation. So these don't necessarily all fit with her, but we'll um, go over them. So if you have a bilateral Duane's retraction syndrome, it could have some characteristics that look like a horizontal gaze palsy, but you wouldn't really see an, uh, a unilateral gaze palsy. This and uh, du but, uh, Duane's retraction, retraction syndrome is really a disinnervation syndrome where you have varying degrees of abduction, adduction, or both deficits in one eye, but the classic hallmark of the disease is this uh, co-contraction of the eye where it is the medial rectus and the lateral rectus are firing at the same time and you have this contraction which causes the palpebral fissure narrowing that we see. These images are of an ipsilateral or a unilateral Duane's, but if you had a bilateral Duane's, it could be, um, you know, you could have, I guess you could think that it was a horizontal gaze palsy, but you do see other potential abnormalities with the eyes and upshoot and downshoot changes, or upshoot um, in certain gazes. So that is probably not really what, you know, in our patient, she doesn't really fit that criteria. Um, there's a kind of another disease called Wildervanck cervical ocular acoustic syndrome, which is a, a triad of Duane's retraction syndrome, clipal fial anomaly, where you have congenital fusion of your cervical vertebrae and sensory neural deafness. These are pretty rare. Um, another disease that's in the spectrum of the disinnervation syndromes is a Mobius syndrome, that we, also known as congenital bulbar paralysis. Um, these patients can have absent abduction or absent horizontal gaze bilaterally, so they can have basically no horizontal gaze, but they do have, um, or they can have preserved vertical gaze. Uh, they, these are kind of congenital problems with the cranial ner nerve nuclei, so they have um, cranial nerve seven uh, palsy, so no, these kind of masked facies, no facial expressions, um, and multiple cranial nerves can be involved, so this is an uh, image demonstrating uh, an atrophic tongue. And on their pathologic findings, they've found um, atrophy and necrosis of cranial nerve nuclei. The one theory for this is potential um, vascular insult in the prenatal period, but it's not completely clear. Another rare disease that could, a congenital disease that could present with a horizontal gaze palsy is this congenital horizontal gaze palsy with progressive scoliosis. Um, it's again in the spectrum of a cr cranial disinnervation syndrome, and uh, these kids can have horizontal gaze palsy. They don't have a horizontal vestibular ocular reflex. Um, they can have isotropia, but they do usually have preserv preservation of their convergence. Um, normal vertical gaze, and they can't initiate saccades, so they have head saccades. And then um, Goucher disease is in the um, uh, metabolic spectrum, so you don't have glucose cerebrosidase, so you can't bra break down your glucose cerebroside. And these, you know, wouldn't they could have just a horizontal gaze palsy, but they can also just have ocular motor apraxia and anything that falls into the supranuclear gaze palsy. They have a lot of other systemic problems and varying, there's different types, so they might not present. Um, there's some infantile types that are more kind of severe, and there's other um, types that present later in life and are more mild. And there's Lee syndrome, which is uh, basically an infant, infantile or uh, neurodegenerative condition, and you can get ophthalmoplegia with this, and again, kind of supranuclear problems um, could be horizontal gaze palsy in that, but they have a lot of other neurologic problems that are kind of degenerative over time. So with our patient, I mean, we have an acute onset of a new gaze palsy. Um, looking at the differential, really the concerning things are a neoplasm. So she did get an MRI, um, and unfortunately, these are the results. So this is a T1 image, and you can see this large hypo-intense lesion here. Um, we see it again on T2 imaging, and hyper-intense here, kind of heterogeneous, and then again here. And you can notice that it's really isolated to the pons, and you have this distinction between the pons medullary junction. 
this is <coughs> this imaging is um, characteristic of a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. And if we go back, we can also see that this lesion is causing mass effect and obstructive hydrocephalus as well. So, unfortunately, this is a really kind of sad diagnosis and a hard one to give patients. I think in this case, it's, you know, I was around when she got the MRI, and it kind of reminds you that as ophthalmologists, we do sometimes have to deliver really bad news and hard news. I think you don't have that experience a lot, but when you do, you know, it's, it's a good learning experience. Um, so this um, is the, uh, this neoplasm is usually diagnosed between five and nine, so it presents in childhood that it can be diagnosed at other ages, but many times the first symptom is a cranial nerve palsy, and typically you see six cranial nerve palsy as the presenting sign. You can have facial paralysis, so patients may came, come in, or parents may come in and say they have, you know, they noted their, or their child has an asymmetric smile, um, and then clumsiness, difficulty wa walking, loss of balance, weakness are all things that can be presenting signs. So our patient had some, you know, tripping that was noted. It's unclear if that was, um, I, you know, I think the parents maybe thought that was from the head turn, but a lot of patients, about a third of patients at diagnosis do have symptoms of increased intracranial pressure because a lot of times these lesions do cause a obstructive hydrocephalus just given their location. Um, and it's a really rapidly progressing disease. So usually um, once the patient starts having symptoms, it's diagnosed within three months and it's, the symptoms progress pretty rapidly. The prognosis is quite poor, um, but it, and it's the main cause of brain uh, tumor-related deaths in children at, the at this time. Um, without radiation, the median survival is about four months. Um, overall survival is 30% at one year, less than 10% at two years. There's rare cases where the patients have had longer-term survival, but these have been associated with um, atypical features clinically and, and in the imaging. So at the moment, the, the treatment that we have is radiation. It's not curative. It only prolongs survival by a mean of three months. Um, a lot of times patients are started on steroids just to try to help some edema. But again, nothing curative. There's, of course, research being done into alternative treatment methods. And they've identified this mutant histone K27 N M in about 80% of cases that is a potential target, um, but you know, they're starting some clinical trials. Nothing that's imminently going to be, you know, available. And then immunotherapy as well is another kind of target. There are a few clinical trials with some vaccines um, against various, uh, or targeted against the, the pontine glioma. But again, nothing that's imminently going to be out. So going back to our patient, um, she was seen again in clinic. This is kind of a month or a few weeks after her MRI. Um, she had gotten hooked up. She, when she got the MRI, she did get admitted, um, had oncology see her. They did more imaging, did spine imaging, um, and got hooked in. So she ended up getting radiation therapy. Um, prior to getting starting her radiation therapy, again, no disc edema was seen. She still had her left gaze paralysis and her left face turn. Um, uh, in a few months later, she progressed and had left facial paresis and lag, ophthalm lag ophthalmos. Um, and then in this time frame, she started getting radiation therapy, and she did have some improvement <clears throat> on her imaging of the <clears throat> brainstem glioma when she was seen again in February, um, she actually had improved adduction of the right eye, so really kind of more of a picture of a isolated uh, left cranial nerve 6 palsy and now in clinical esotropia. And she still had a really, really significant head term that was, you know, difficult for her. So the decision was made to 
do surgery, and she was taken to the operating room because of basically no function and um, forced sections in the OR. Um, vertical rectus transposition with a foster suture modification was done and a Botox in the left medial rectus. Or sorry, oh yeah, that's correct. Um, and the foster modification is basically doing a fixation suture to attach the superior, the transposed superior rectus and the transposed inferior rectus to the lateral rectus to try to give it more power. And on her five week follow up, she did have an improved face turn and a little bit of near intermittent hypertropia um, and a little bit of exotropia in primary position. But overall, they were very, you know, her parents felt like this was a great improvement. But unfortunately, um, around February, she did have increased tumor size on her MRI, and then she was put on hospice and did kind of pass away. So she, you know, this, it's a really sad case. I think the, for me, the things that stood out for the case is just kind of be, first of all, delivering really hard news more than just, you know, you won't be seeing again, but that this is a kind of a, a lethal malignancy in a child. And then also, you know, it is hard to do a, at times a, a pediatric eye exam, but knowing that this is the potential when you have to know that that's an option before you call something a Duane's or a Mobius or saying it's a congenital thing because these do need to be picked up and where some, you know, many times the ophthalmologist might be the, the first person seeing it and the, the doctor that has to actually order the MRI and diagnose it before it, um, you know, before time goes on. So that is my case. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Dr. Katz? Uh, so not to cast any dispersions, but why operate on a little girl whose life expectancy is less than Well, I'm, I don't, yeah. I, it's a quality of life thing. Um, and so I think just based on the difficulty and the parents feeling like the head turn was a, you know, was a problem and that that was enough of a thing. And in February, her, I mean, her scan had gotten better, and then it got worse. So I don't think, I mean, the life expectancy thing, we know overall the statistics, but I don't think for her at that time, you, you know, if you the parents, know. yeah, you never know, and it was basically quality of life operation, I think. And it's Dr. Jesus, I mean, if you have anything, I think that was the rationale, which is very reasonable. Whatever you can, do, I mean, if the parents and the patient are having, you know, head turn and neck pain and everything from this head turn, then, yeah. you know, she's on hospice, but it is a quality of life intervention at that point. Sure. All right. So, Julie, yeah. That's a great presentation. Do you, you know, we're now treating a lot of other gliomas mm -hmm. with carboplatin and other <clears throat> chemotherapy agents. Did you find anything? Because We've got actually, I mean, in, compared to when we use radiation treatment mm -hmm. for, you know, visual pathway, or optic pathway gliomas in NF1, yeah. and even the non-NF1 tumors, they respond wonderfully yeah. when they're causing troubles. Is, I mean, these, these are very grow much more rapidly, more aggressively, yeah. is that? They, they've done studies and they hadn't shown, you know, in the studies that they did with other chemotherapy agents, there wasn't any improvement. Um, and just kind of cause more toxicity. So there has, I mean, at this point, the focus is really on kind of the more novel mechanisms, but the chemotherapy agents that are tried haven't worked. And I think, you know, the location and the rapidly, the rapid progression, I think, just put it in a little bit of a different category. But yeah, Dr. Warner. I think the other thing with optic pathway gliomas is that um, they're such a different, um, Tumor. Yeah. Some people even wonder if there was a huge debate at Nanos the other year about are they, they are they really gliomas or are they just teratomas, mm -hmm. and should they be treated with chemotherapy ever? Sometimes not at all because there's a there's a pretty high spontaneous regression rate, even with vision and with uh, imaging. Right. Uh, so it, I think it's been very difficult to to show unequivocally that whatever we do to treat optic pathway gliomas is actually 
um, better than the natural history, which is so good anyway in children. Right. Uh, it's a relief. Whereas these guys, guys yeah. these, these uh, uh, diffuse pontine gliomas are just so uniformly fatal. Yes. Um, that, I think that might even argue for ongoing and more aggressive trials of chemotherapy of chemo because right. it's like you don't have very much to lose. Right. Whereas in a, a tumor that's going to potentially regress on its own, then you have to be pretty sure you're actually doing something beneficial. Well, it, that is also going to grow and cause harm. But right. the kids that were treated, I mean, what this reminds me of, as far as the collateral damage with radiation that we induce in kids with the optopathway gliomas with NF1, right, it's yeah. horrendous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and it's such a, 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 a night and day difference. So it'd be very cool if they could find something yeah. medical to. Uh, I mean, at this point, the radiation therapy is, I mean, it's. They don't have any, yeah, I mean, and kind of, it doesn't, you know, it's like prolonging things by not very long, but you don't even see the downstream consequences because unfortunately the survival rate is so low, but that's kind of like the option we have and they're using, there's a lot of clinical trials and I mean, hopefully there are things that as they're studying genetics and more of the mutations, but down the line, yeah, yeah, there wasn't, you know, it looks like there had been some studies done and nothing really panned out, and now the focus is more on the kind of alternative, newer methods of treatment from what I've seen.